The start of World War II and the US policy of neutrality. In this video, we will examine the start of the war in Europe and America's efforts to stay out of the war. The rise of dictatorship in Europe. After World War I, many European empires had fallen. New countries were formed. And in many cases, monarchies were replaced with democracy. Unfortunately, the new democracies in Europe were fragile and would ultimately succumb to a new rise of nationalism, the difficult economic situation, and the fear of communism. A new political ideology was on the rise in Europe, fascism. Fascism was first introduced by Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, who took power in 1922. Fascism incorporated feelings of intense nationalism and racism, along with obedience to the party leader, protection of the common people, and calls for violent action. In Germany, the economic downturn caused by the Great Depression was worsened by the burden of reparations and other provisions of the Versailles Treaty. Under these circumstances, the Nazi or National Socialist Party of Germany was born, and Adolf Hitler soon emerged as its natural leader. The Nazis believed that Germans were a superior race, destined to dominate over Europe. They considered Poles and Russians as ethnically inferior and blamed Jews for Germany's economic situation and their defeat in World War I. The Nazi ideology included absolute obedience to the state and their Führer or leader, as well as social Darwinist beliefs aimed at eliminating weaknesses and asserting German superiority. Nazis were not afraid to use violence to intimidate the opposition. They even had a paramilitary wing called the SA, or Storm Division. With German unemployment reaching devastating proportions, membership in both the Nazi and the German Communist Party soared as voters looked for radical solutions to their problems. In the 1933 elections, the Nazi party won more seats than any other party, and a conservative coalition appointed Hitler as chancellor, the head of the German government. Only a month after his appointment, arsonists set the Reichstag building, which housed the German legislature, on fire. Most historians point out that Nazis themselves were responsible. After the fire, Hitler called for emergency powers, and Nazis soon began murdering and imprisoning opponents, persecuting Jews, and taking control of schools, labor unions, and other German institutions. Opposition newspapers were closed, political parties were banned, and the German armed forces were required to swear personal allegiance to Hitler. Germany had effectively become a totalitarian dictatorship. The failure of the League of Nations. After World War I, the League of Nations was created to prevent all future wars based on the principle of collective security. The League had no army of its own and depended on members to defend each other from aggression. The United States never joined the League, and the same was true for the Soviet Union. Japan and Germany left the League in 1933, and soon the League's failure to prevent war and their inability to deal with the aggressive acts of Hitler and other dictators was clear. In clear violation of the Versailles Treaty, Hitler began rebuilding German military power, and in 1936, 
His troops entered the demilitarized zone in the Rhineland on the French border. Britain, France, and the League of Nations were alarmed, but ultimately failed to stop Hitler. The League of Nations was also unable to halt a series of aggressions, including the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935, and foreign intervention in the Spanish Civil War. In Spain, right-winged forces, commanded by General Francisco Franco and aided by Germany and Italy, eventually succeeded in overturning Spain's elected socialist government, establishing a fascist regime there. Appeasement In March 1938, Hitler annexed Austria and demanded the Sudetenland, a German-speaking region of Czechoslovakia. Initially, France and Britain had promised to protect Czechoslovakia, even as Hitler threatened war. Benito then invited British and French leaders to meet with Hitler in Munich to work out a solution. In September 1938, at the Munich Conference, France and Britain agreed to hand over the Sudetenland to Germany in exchange for Hitler's promise not to make any further demands. This policy of appeasement or giving in to the demands of a potential enemy to avoid war was a total failure. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain returned to London convinced of the conference success and promised peace in our time. Hitler, on the other hand, was convinced that France and Britain had a major weakness. They were reluctant to go to war. Hitler's territorial demands would continue, despite his promises, and would ultimately lead to war. World War II begins. After annexing the Sudetenland, Hitler persuaded the Slovaks to declare independence and sent an army to occupy Prague. Next, he made demands on Poland, claiming the free city of Danzig, present-day Gdańsk, which had a numerous German-speaking population. France and Britain, now convinced that Hitler's demands had no limits, resisted these demands and vowed to protect Poland at all costs. Hitler knew that invading Poland would alarm the Soviet Union and decided to negotiate a secret treaty with the Soviet dictator, Joseph Stalin. Under the Nazi-Soviet pact, Hitler and Stalin agreed to divide Poland's territory. In September 1939, Germany invaded Poland from the west, while the Soviet Union invaded from the east. As a result, France and Britain immediately declared war on Germany, and thus World War II began in Europe. The Nazi occupation of Poland was swift, and in just over a month, the German army had full control of Western Poland. A new war tactic called Blitzkrieg or lightning warfare was used. Germany advanced quickly by combining forces from airplanes, tanks, and motorized troop carriers, along with radio communications. The Fall of France After the declaration of war, the French did not attack Germany. In April 1940, Germany suddenly invaded Denmark and Norway and then continued to invade the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg in May. France had constructed a series of fortifications along the German border in the event of invasion, creating a barrier known as the Maginot Line. German troops avoided the barrier and decided to invade France through Belgium. The German troops invaded through the Ardennes Forest, where nobody was expecting them, and then marched west 
to the coast, cutting off and cornering a British expeditionary force stationed in Dunkirk. In an extraordinary operation, the British sent all kinds of boats to evacuate the soldiers. By June 1940, the French forces had surrendered. The Battle of Britain Next, Hitler turned his attention to Britain. In the Battle of Britain, Hitler used his Luftwaffe, or Air Force, to bomb London and other cities, to create terror, and force the British to surrender. British forces were able to shoot down many of the attacking German planes, while the general population endured the bombings by crowding into bomb shelters or the subway stations of the London Underground. The invention of the radar allowed the British to detect enemy planes and warn the population of possible attacks. America's Partial Neutrality After World War I, the United States withdrew again from world affairs and returned to its traditional policy of isolationism. As part of their isolationist agenda, the United States had refused to join the League of Nations, insisting on collecting war debts, past high tariffs, and restricted immigration. There were only a few exceptions to this trend, the Washington Naval Conference, and the Kellogg-Briand Pact, both of which were aimed at promoting peace. By the 1930s, the nation's isolationism was driven by the economic problems of the Great Depression, which obviously required a complete focus on domestic affairs. Isolationist feelings would be strengthened by the Nye Committee Report in 1936 which revealed how American munition companies had greatly profited from the previous war. As Britain and France stopped payment of their war debts, Congress also passed an act prohibiting new loans to our allies. Further legislation would focus on keeping America out of the war with a series of neutrality acts. The Neutrality Act of 1935 was the first one passed for a limited period of six months. The act prohibited Americans from sending arms, munitions, and war equipment to foreign nations at war. The treaty was applied to both Italy and Ethiopia, even though Italy had been the aggressor. Additionally, this law warned Americans traveling on ships of nations at war that they did so at their own risk. The Neutrality Act of 1936 renewed the 1935 Act for another 14 months and added a prohibition on loans to countries at war. Since the Act was not specific about civil wars and non-military equipment, American companies still profited by selling trucks and oil to General Franco in the Spanish Civil War. The Neutrality Act of 1937 tried to close the gaps of the previous act by extending the prohibition on the sale of arms to parties engaged in civil war. That way, the Spanish conflict was included. The sale of non-military goods to countries at war was allowed, as long as the transaction was done on a cash-and-carry basis. In other words, the buyer had to pay cash and make arrangements to pick up and transport the equipment. In July 1937, Japan invaded China. In that case, President Roosevelt refused to apply the terms of the Neutrality Act to that conflict, since war had not been officially declared. This allowed Americans to continue sending supplies to China. In October 1937, Roosevelt tested the American opinion by denouncing Japan in his famous quarantine speech. According to him, peaceful nations must band together to quarantine aggressive nations, suggesting perhaps imposing economic sanctions. 
Public opinion was still divided on this issue. The Neutrality Act of 1939 was passed to update the law to the circumstances in Europe and the start of the war. Roosevelt and the majority in Congress favored helping our allies, Britain and France, while keeping the United States out of the war. The new Neutrality Act forbid Americans from entering war zones and renewed the cash and carry provisions of the 1937 Act to non-military goods. The new law, however, allowed for the sale of arms as well, as a way of helping our allies. The fall of France in 1940 changed the situation in Europe. America began making preparations for war, just in case they were drawn into the conflict. The first peacetime draft was implemented. Men between the ages of 21 and 35 were actively recruited. The American public continued to be divided on this issue. While isolationists and pro-German groups opposed all forms of assistance to the British, groups like the Committee to Defend America or the Century Group actively lobbied for support. As the British lacked the number of ships to face a possible German invasion across the English Channel, Roosevelt bypassed Congress and sent 50 destroyers to Great Britain in exchange for a lease on British bases in Canada and the Caribbean. In 1940, Roosevelt broke American political tradition by running for a third term. His re-election came at a time when the British were desperate for food and arms. In one of his fireside chats, Roosevelt described America as the arsenal for democracy, explaining that the best way to avoid involvement in the war was to support the nations combating against the aggressive Axis powers. In 1941, the Neutrality Act of 1939 was repealed and replaced with the lend lease Act. U.S. companies were authorized to sell, lease, or lend war materials to any country whose defense the president deemed vital to the defense of the United States. Congress stimulated the production of ships, tanks, planes, as well as other weapons and military equipment. Even though these measures encountered some critics, most Americans supported Roosevelt's view that helping the British resistance against Nazi Germany would help keep the U.S. out of war. In his 1941 State of the Union address, Roosevelt told Americans of his hopes to establish a world based on four freedoms. Freedom of speech and expression. Freedom of every person to worship God in his own way. Freedom from want, by which he meant reducing poverty, and freedom from fear, by which he meant avoiding future wars and reducing armaments. Aboard a ship off the coast of Canada, Roosevelt secretly met with British Prime Minister Winston Churchill to discuss their objectives for a post-war world. By this time, Roosevelt was convinced that the United States would enter the war. Both leaders stressed their intentions of restoring self-government of all territories occupied by Axis powers and shared their vision of a world with free trade, freedom of the seas, reduction of armaments, and cooperation to increase economic development and social welfare. Their joint statement became known as the Atlantic Charter and served as the foundation for the United Nations, a new international organization that would replace the League of Nations and foster international cooperation. That same year, the U.S. occupied Greenland and Iceland to prevent the German takeover, and armed merchant ships began carrying supplies directly to Britain. It was only a matter of time before the U.S. entered the war. In the next video, we will take a look at the United States' entry into the war, and the arrangements and conditions in the home front.
as America prepared to fight in Europe and in the Pacific.